Well, we have been um, working through some of uh, the Psalms that are really aimed at bringing encouragement to us in times of uh, fear, in times of stress, in times of worry, anxiety. This morning, we're taking that uh, focus uh, and we're really going to be um, zeroing in on the whole uh, difficulty and challenge that so many of us have when it comes to fear. Because, you know, fear is pretty universal. Fear is something that uh, everybody experiences from one time or another. Even those who say, I fear nothing, fear being cowardly, right? You know, they, they, they're, they're afraid of being afraid. And so uh, fear is something that touches all of us. If we're honest, we have to admit that at various times and in various degrees, we experience fear. For some of us, it's temporary, it's short-lived. For others of us, it's something that we live with every moment of every day. And so fear is one of those things that, that we naturally want to try to overcome or to eliminate from our lives. Um, because it really is um, not only so prevalent, but it's something that none of us likes to experience, right? Unless you're like one of those people who likes to like be shocked half to death, you know, by, by um, you know, going to, I don't know, not scary farm or I don't know, whatever. But, uh, but for the most part, not that kind, we're not talking about that kind of fear. We're talking about the, about the kind of fear that paralyzes us, that grips our lives, that, that um, absolutely um, smothers us. And uh, if you take a, a, a search on Amazon.com, you'll find that when it comes to, if you just type in overcoming fear, you will find more than 3,000 books and resources that will try to tell you how it is that you can overcome fear. It's, there's so much out there because there's so much demand for that kind of information. And, you know, of course, you, we've, we've all heard a lot of the, the tips that, that have been given to overcome fear. You know, um, just face your fears. That's one of them. Embrace your fears. Uh, uh, take your fear and turn it into something that is, is not as threatening, like a kitten or something like that. Um, uh, meditate away your fears. Medicate away your fears. The, the list goes on. Uh, you know, the, take your fears and um, um, turn it into something good. Uh, go to your happy place. All those, all those things are things that, that are out there in terms of here's how, you, here's how you deal with fear. And yet, when it comes down to the best response to fear, uh, Scripture is really where we turn. And what we find in Scripture is that the best response to fear all hinges upon one thing. And that one thing is our view of God. When it comes to overcoming fear, the most important thing that we can take into account is our view of God. Asking ourselves the question, how do I see God? So if our view of God is big, it's a, it's a truthful, accurate, realistic view of God, then the things that we fear become very small in comparison. If our view of God is small, if that's something that we're still growing in, and obviously, you know, to be honest, we are all always growing in that, seeing a bigger, better, clearer picture of God. But if our view of God is small, then the things that we fear are going to be big in comparison. And so fear is something that, again, we all deal with it, deal with, and when those fears become bigger than God, they tend to have control over us. Now, I remember, and some of you may remember back with me, some of you are actually there. Uh, this is where you're, you're actually at in life. But in middle school and high school, um, remember um, um, those times in your life never uh, was maybe fear of others in particular, fear of what others thought of you, such a, such a big thing. Um, that, I remember, was, was really huge. It's still huge for many of us as adults today, right? But I remember back in, uh, in middle school, 
as a seventh grader. For me, when I was a kid, middle school started in seventh grade. And uh, so uh, when I went into middle school, I, I learned that um, there, was, there were certain things that were, were very important in terms of making sure that you um, were part of the cool crowd, kind of the fitting into that, that crowd that was, you know, they kind of had it all together. And, and really probably one of the bigger uh, indicators of whether you were part of the cool in crowd or not were the shoes that you wore. How many remember that? How many remember shoes being like a huge, I mean, my shoes have always been huge, but, but uh, shoes were, all, were just a huge thing about, you know, and, and when I was a kid, it was like Nike was king. And so uh, when I was about that age, I remember that, um, you know, we weren't always uh, rolling in, in money. We, sometimes finances were tight. Uh, my dad sold cars for a living, so it was either feast or famine, right? And so there were times when we were pretty comfortable, but there were other times when finances were really tight. And my mom, bless her heart, she's here this morning. I, I don't, uh, this is, you know, she, she was, this is a, a praise to her because she did such a good job raising us. But anyway, I remember during those lean times that uh, we would get the privilege of wearing the $1.99 specials from the Yellow Front store. I don't know if you had Yellow Front stores, but, but they actually had tennis shoes you could buy for $1.99. And, uh, and that's what we wore sometimes. I mean, now you can't hardly even buy a pair of shoelaces for $1.99, right? But I remember going to, to school one day in my $1.99 yellow front specials, uh, basketball shoes. And very quickly realizing that, you know what? I got the wrong shoes on. If I want to be accepted, if I want to be in the, the cool crowd, I'm not wearing the right shoes. So in my seventh grade mind, which was not that brilliant at the time, I, I thought I had a, a, a solution to this problem. Because already, I, the first day, it seems like, I remember hearing something, someone you know, you know how kids can be mean in middle school? Um, you know, I mean, people can be, I mean, there are always some people that are mean everywhere, right? But middle school, that's, that's like a breeding ground for mean kids, right? And so I remember some kids saying, what oh, nice dollar ninety nine shoes you got there, you know? And uh, so I, I thought, oh man, this is not good. So I remember going home, and I had this solution to the problem. And that was that I took a magic marker, and I drew... Nike swooshes on the sides of my shoes, thinking this is going to take care of it. So the next day, I go to school wearing my $1.99 faux Nikes, and, uh, and of course, what's the, one of the first things I hear, probably from one of my good friends, actually, uh, was, hey, dude, you, how come you're wearing $1.99 tennis shoes with Nike swooshes drawn on with magic marker? And I don't remember what, I, what my response was. It was probably something like, what? You know, what are you talking about? You know? But really, the reason that I did that was fear of people. Fear of what they would think. Fear of what they would say. Fear of not being accepted by them. And, and, and you know, that's something that we kind of laugh about looking at our, back on those years, or maybe for some of you who are that age, you go, yeah, it's, it's still kind of like that in a lot of ways. Maybe it's not tennis shoes, but it's something else. We still deal with the same kind of stuff, even in adult life, right? We still think about and worry about and, and, and get concerned about what people think of us. We, we get concerned about what people say about us, what, what people's picture of our reputation is. And, and it can become something that, that we live in under the control of because it's a fear that becomes bigger than God himself oftentimes. This is why a little bit, but in a much larger and serious kind of sense, that, that David, King David in the Old Testament, was dealing with when he wrote Psalm 27. We're going to turn there if you, if you want to take your Bibles or your, or your venture apps and open those up to Psalm 27. We're going to look at, at uh, this psalm that David wrote. Um, but David knew what it was to deal with the fear of people. He experienced the fear of man because at various times in David's life, he was being pursued. There were people that wanted to kill him. If you, if you go back to uh, the, the, the time when King Saul was pursuing David, not just King Saul himself, but he had his armies pursuing David. 
Saul wanted David dead because of his popularity. He was jealous. And so David had times where he was being pursued by, by King Saul and by his armies. He was being sometimes pursued by the Philistines, who were the enemies of Israel. Sometimes he was even being pursued by his own family members. If you read about the story of, of Absalom, who was his son, who wanted, him, wanted to kill him so that he could become king. David knew what he was talking about when he wrote about how to deal with and how to overcome fear. And this psalm that we're looking at this morning is just one of the, uh, one of the most significant psalms when it comes to the idea of overcoming fear. How is it that we, as God's people, can say, whom shall I fear, in a way that is as rhetorical, in a way that we know that the answer is, well, there's nobody that I should fear. So this is what David is, is writing about. And so in this passage of, of Scripture, uh, Psalm 27, we're going to see four sections. And each of these sections has a different theme and something a little different going on in, in, them, in them. So the first section, we're going to see where uh, David is, is focusing on uh, his trust in God. He's declaring his trust in God because of who God is and what he's done in his life. The second section that we're going to see is that um, we, we see a response from David to fear through worship. So we have trusting God, worshiping God as a, a way that he is talking about, writing about, responding to fear. And then we see a little bit of a, 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 a turn of um, of rhetoric, a, a different way in which David is speaking or writing here when he begins to, to express his, his fears in prayer. And so we see a little bit of a wavering of faith in this, in this third section where we often see from David, he, I mean, David, one thing we, we always say about David is that he's very human, right? He is not perfect. He was not this super spiritual, amazing person, though he was a man who, was, who God says uh, in 1 Samuel, he says about David that he was a man after his own heart, after God's own heart. Still, David was human, and he had fears, and he had, he had times where his faith was weak, and so in many of the Psalms, especially the Psalms of, um, of lament uh, or imprecatory Psalms where he's, we see David kind of sometimes saying, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? God, don't forsake me. So we see a little of that in, the, in this third section here. But, but the focus is prayer. David is praying to the Lord. And then that fourth section uh, uh, comes down to this final call to wait. To wait on the Lord. To wait on His goodness. And so uh, those are the... the sections of the themes that we're going to be seeing in this, in this passage of Scripture. So take, uh, take your Bibles, let's look at, at what it says here. Starting with verse 1 in Psalm 27. It says here, it's a psalm of David. And it goes on and it begins with this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an, an army encamp against me, my, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. So look at how, just in these first three verses, David describes who God has been to him personally. This is, this is David speaking from his own personal experience. And he, he, he writes, the Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. He is my salvation. He's my stronghold. Let's look at those three things. First of all, the Lord is my light. And what is it the light does? Well, it dispels darkness. And for David, God was that light in his life that, was, would, that chased out the darkness of evil. Those things that he might fear. Attacks from even uh, Satan himself that were evil in nature, that were shrouded in darkness. And yet he, he declares that the Lord is my light. Because what does light do? It floods out the darkness. 
it eliminates darkness. And so that's, that's the first description that David gives of, of God. He goes on to say, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is the one who saves me and has saved me, David is saying. Again, David is looking back on a whole host of experiences in which God literally saved him from the jaws of death. And so the Lord is my, is my salvation. He's my light. He's my salvation. For us as Christ followers, because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we also know that in an eternal sense, God is our salvation through his son Christ. That God has provided us deliverance and salvation from, from three major enemies, just like David had his enemies that God saved him from. Well, there are three major enemies that God through Christ has saved us. That first one is Satan. Satan is the one who, he's like a, a, a lion prowling around seeking someone to devour. And his, most, his greatest desire is to devour people who follow Christ. So we have this enemy Satan who wants to do everything in his power to hinder us from not only knowing God better, but also from shining the light of his gospel, of his goodness, of his greatness to the world around us, which is a dark place. But So there's uh, salvation from Satan, salvation from sin. Obviously, sin is our greatest problem, and we need salvation from that. Without salvation from sin, we have no relationship with God the Father. We have salvation from sin through Jesus Christ. But the third thing is that, that we, is an enemy to us that we need salvation from is self. I need salvation from myself because it's myself that is in and of itself, apart from Christ, wicked to the core. I can say that about myself because I know myself. But I can probably say it about all of us here in this room, right? Because we're all human, we're all the same in that way. But we are bent towards evil, apart from Christ. And so we need to be saved from ourselves, and, and God provides all of that for us, just like he provided salvation for David. And so David was able to say, God is my salvation, just as we are able to say God is our salvation. And then he goes on to say that the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Now that word stronghold is, is really descriptive. It, it, it describes a place of impenetrable safety and protection. That's what it's talking about here. There, It's a, a stronghold. It, and um, you picture this. Now, in fact, um, that word in the Hebrew that is translated stronghold, actually uh, a form of that Hebrew word is the word Masad. Now think about, if you're at all familiar with Israel history, um, think of a place that was a stronghold for the people of God. Well, Masada. You know, some of you, we, we know the story of Masada. Well, that's that's literally uh, translated stronghold, refuge, fortress. And that's, that's exactly what Masada was. Actually, my daughter Lizzie was, was there just this past semester. Actually got to hike up to Masada, right? And, and hike down? Yes, one of the, I think that was one of the most difficult experiences of her life from what I remember, but uh, her saying. But um, this this fortress, this stronghold of Masada was, was it, I've been there, Amy and I have been there as well. Our, one of our other daughters, Kayla, has been there. Um, but we've actually been able to walk around. Many of you have been there. Raise your hand if you've been to Masada. Yeah, and you know how, how that fits this description of what a stronghold is. It's, it's this place high upon this mountain with a flat kind of a, a mesa tabletop on it. And there's this... Uh, this fortress that actually was developed, built by King Herod, Herod the Great, back like 30, 37 B.C. And uh, this was a place where he would go if he was under attack. And it was a very safe place. It was a place that, that uh, you could not just, you know, drive your wagons up the road into, the, into Masada, but there were only three trails that led up this very high mountain top um, that were single track trails. And so the great thing about that was that if a, an army would try to invade Masada, they would have to
go single file up these trails. And that would have been easy for the people up on the top to just be picking them off with rocks or whatever, shooting with arrows or whatever they had. And so it was pretty well protected until the Roman military machine finally, in about 72 AD, came and they built a siege ramp, something that took several months in, to, to accomplish. The planning and, and the actual execution of, of that uh, took uh, over a year to do. But uh, it was finally the Romans that were finally able to do that, but it took them months and months in order to build this mound of dirt using 15,000 workers. Some of those were, were Roman soldiers, but a lot of them were slaves that, uh, and, and prisoners of war. And so with all that manpower, they were finally able to, to build this ramp that would get them up to the city. They were able to breach the wall. And if you know the story, uh, the, the, rather than wanting to be taken captive or killed by the Romans, the nearly 1,000 inhabitants who were holed up there in Masada decided that they would rather commit suicide than to be taken by the Romans. And that's exactly what they did. Um, there were only five, I think it was five, who survived or who, who were left um, alive in that. And so that's a, a picture. As I see the word stronghold, that's where my mind goes. It's a place like Masada, a place that was, was safe and protected for the most part. I mean, it was um, virtually impenetrable. Um, the Romans proved that it wasn't completely that. But God, for us, is that perfect stronghold. And David knew that. When David was thinking about those who were pursuing his life, he also recognized the truth that he had the perfect, perfectly powerful God who was his fortress, his refuge, his protector. And so, so this, is, this is all a, part of, a, a very important part of this psalm because David is laying out who it is that God is to him. He's, he's establishing who God is. He's, 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 he's declaring to us, his readers, his view of God. And because of that view that he had of God, he could say, whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? And so that's, that's really where David starts. God is big. He's my light, he's my salvation, he's my stronghold, and so I have, I have nothing or no one, specifically no one, to fear. And so he goes on to say, my enemies will stumble and fall rather than me. Of whom shall I be afraid? Even when surrounded by an enemy army and they rise up against me in battle, he says, yet I will be confident. Think about that. Even though I'm surrounded by enemy armies, even though they are on the, on the verge of attack, even though we're on the brink of war, he says, yet I am confident, or I will be confident. You know what that's talking about? What that's referring to? His trust in God. He says, I will trust in God. I will trust God no matter what the circumstance, no matter how, how intense my enemy, uh, the, the enemy um, advance or attack might be, I, yet I will be confidence. And confidence is the antithesis of fear. And confidence is something that we as God's people can have in the face of fear. So, again, why was David able to have such confidence instead of fear? Well, because of his view of God. Well, not only did David have a right view of God, but he also had passion for God. By the way, if you're taking notes, that first section is all about trusting God. So the, the action point there is simply trust God. The second action point is worship God. God David had a, had a passion for God, a passion and a desire to, to be in his presence. Again, uh, in 1 Samuel, we see that God said, this is a man after my own heart, meaning that, that he desires me. He has a passion for me. It's God speaking. 
He had a passion for God that moved him to worship God. And it was, it was in that place of worship that David was able to experience God's protective presence. I think so many times, I, myself included, we totally underestimate the worship of God's people, don't we? I mean, for so many of us, we tend to make it all about our preference. We tend about, to make it about what, what instruments are play, playing or not playing up on the stage. And we will actually let that kind of thing cause us to withhold, withhold our worship to God. I think we all do it. You know, if it's not rocking enough, I can't worship God. If it's not quiet enough, I can't worship it, You know, it, it, that, we have opportunity to come together to worship God, and it shouldn't be based on our preference or what we like. It should be based on the greatness of God. If we have a passion for God, we ought to come before Him every chance we get and take advantage of the opportunity that we have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. To let that passion for Him overflow out of our hearts. And you know what? That's the kind of worship that, that David is, is describing here. He talks about, we're going to read here in, a, in just a second, about being in God's presence. Being in his, in his tent, in His temple. And just gazing on His beauty. That's worship. That's what we get to do when we come together. We don't even have to come together to do that, but it's a great way for us to do that. We can do that personally, privately as well. Worship of God for David was something that he found to be, to be protective, where he, he experienced God's protective presence. Let's, let's look at, at these verses, starting with verse 4. He says this, One thing I have asked of, of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. This is talking about the, the temple of God. This is talking about the, the place where God's Spirit dwelt in that time. His presence was there. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. So that's, let's, let's just look at that first of all. He says, this one thing. He says, one thing have I asked for the Lord. This is something of supreme importance for David. This was what was most desired. One thing I have asked of the Lord, and that is to be, to, to be in His presence, to dwell in His house, to be where He is, to gaze upon His beauty in, in worship. That was David's priority. That was the thing that was most important to David. The glory of God. Worshiping God for who he is and all that he had done. And, and so, again, we see here that, that David has this, this view of God that, that goes so far beyond just, you know, oh, God is God, you know. or, or it, it was not at all uh, underrated. But he had this high view of God and he was passionate for him and his desire was to worship him and he also realized, he knew, that it was in that place of worship that he found God's protective presence. And you know, that is so true for us as well. Especially when it comes to the spiritual battle that rages around us. When we are worshiping together, I read a quote by uh, John Piper not long ago. But it, it, uh, I wish I could uh, uh, repeat it to you word for word. But it was something along these lines, that when we worship, all of hell trembles because that is when we are doing the most damage against the powers of evil, the powers of Satan. And that's exactly what happens when we, when we worship as well. Satan trembles when we worship. Why? Because the worship of God casts out all evil and is a place of protection that we have from evil. Look at verse 5, what he goes on to say. He says, For he, meaning God, will hide me in the shelter, in, I'm, I'm sorry, will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent, and he will lift me high upon a rock. So those three things, that he, God, will, God will hide me, God will conceal me, and he will lift me up. 
That is what he does in that place of worship. It's in the worship of God that worry and fear can, cannot coexist because there is safety and shelter there in that place. Verse 6 then goes on to say, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his, in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Again, it's just a picture of worship on David's part. The worship that David longs for, that he has a passion for because of his passion for God. And then we see that David is, again, as I mentioned earlier, he's human just like we are. Uh, and so he shifts a little bit of his focus now. And you, you really do kind of see this, this kind of a wavering maybe of his faith or kind of a, you know, he's saying all these things, he's affirming things about the power of God, the presence of God, his protection. But now he goes into this kind of a mode of, but God... I want to make sure you're there for me. Let's look at what uh, the, the following verses say, starting in verse 7. This is, this is David's prayer to the Lord. He says, hear o, Lord, hear, o Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you have, who have been my help, cast me not off forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. The false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. Here we see David uh, in prayer. What he's doing here is that he's engaging in, in prayer, and prayer that is, that is crying out to God for his help, crying out to God not to, to send him away or to, to forsake him, but he's, he's saying, Lord, Lord, I'm calling on you to take me in. I'm calling on you to be the one who dispels my, my fears. And so... The action point here that we see from David is that we need to fight fear with prayer. So first, we need to trust God. Second, we need to worship God. Third, we need to fight fear with prayer, especially during those times when our faith is wavering. And, and again, those are times that we all experience. When our faith wavers, what is it that we need to be doing? When we, we, when we let our, our weak faith cause us to be controlled by fear, we need to pray. And that, the, the very times then that, that we are the least likely to pray, or maybe the, the least motivated to pray. Because isn't that true the way it is sometimes? Sometimes we're in the most trouble. Those are the times in, that we're the least motivated to pray. There are other times when we're in trouble and we just say, you know, help God. But, but sometimes it's those times that we're least motivated to pray that we need to, we need to come before God in prayer. So, God is use, uh, David is using these phrases like, hear and answer me in verse 7. Verse 8, he says, I am seeking your face. Verse 9, don't forsake me, God of my salvation. Don't, don't turn me away. And then he turns back again to faith in verse 10 when he says, even if my father and mother forsake me and and I think David was probably just using this as, a, as an example. We don't have record of you know, David's father and mother um, you know, um, disowning him or anything like that. But he says, basically, though my father and mother forsake me, you will not turn me away, Lord, but you will take me in. It goes on in verse 11 to say, teach me and lead me. Verse 12, don't let my enemies with violent intentions succeed in bringing me down all those are our prayer requests all those are utterances of prayer to god statements that he's making in crying out to god and so when we feel our faith wavering when we feel our faith faltering that's when we need to pray because 
in that place of prayer is strengthening of faith and is an affirmation of God's protection. That's what, that's what David comes down to here. He says, you know, God, you are the one who will take me in. You're the one who is my, my protector and provider. And then finally in verses 13 and 14, we're going to close in just a few minutes, uh, he, he caps this, this psalm off with this great last action point um, challenge that he issues um, in describing what it is that he himself uh, does. He says, verse 13, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So the action point here is wait with courage. When we are pursued by people who, though we may not be physically pursued, when we are being, uh, when we are the targets of maybe slanderous things that are said, or people that that just want to see us fail. And believe me, we all have those people uh, in our lives, people that don't want us to succeed, people that 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 don't want for us to to have just that sense of peace and protection that God provides for us. We all have that. When when that when when we experience that. Ultimately, what we need to do is, is trust God, worship Him. We need to go to Him in prayer. And then we need to wait. Wait with courage. David starts that last little section by saying, I believe. And so here's a statement of faith that he's making. I believe, here's what he believes, that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So David, by faith, is asserting that he will see or experience God's goodness in his lifetime. That's what he means by about the, the, the land of the living. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He's expecting that God is going to answer in his lifetime, answer in the present, in a sense. But then he goes on to say, wait. Wait on the Lord. And so that's the, really the second uh, uh, kind of part of this last encouragement or last uh, Point of action, waiting with courage. He says, um, wait for the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. So be encouraged, not discouraged, but wait for God's goodness, God's provision. And really that's the emphasis here. Because Paul, or David mentions that, uses that line two times, wait for the Lord. Sometimes it's hard for us to wait for God to act. Sometimes it's hard for us to, to be patient enough and courageous enough to see the goodness of God in our lifetime and to trust that God's goodness is there for us in all of our circumstances so that we don't need to live lives in fear. Again, David's fear here is directed towards people. Uh, it's, he's talking about, he's asking the question, who shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Really, he's, he's talking about people not being bigger than God is in his life. And so he doesn't need to be afraid because of who God is. Fear can be paralyzing. It can hold us captives, captive. There are good kinds of fear that some fear can save your life, but Again, that's not the kind of fear that David is talking about here. There's a fear that, um, that is, is destructive for us. There's a fear that controls us, especially when it comes to the fear of, of others and what they can do against us. That, and it's, and it's, it's that kind of fear that causes us to become powerless and to become helpless to to become stalled in our, our growth in our relationship with God. But it's that fear that when we see God in the light of who He is, that actually becomes powerless in our lives. That really is the key. We have the right view of God. And that's, that's why 
that is one of our core values. We talk about having a view of God that is worthy of God at Venture Church. When we have a view of God that is worthy of God, we can trust Him, we can worship Him, we can pray to Him in times of, of needing uh, strength and faith, and we can, we can wait. We can wait. So we have to ask ourselves. We, we can't go away from this passage without asking, okay, well, what are those things right now in my life that I'm fearing? What is, what is it that, that has got me maybe paralyzed right now? What is the thing that is just kind of looming for some of us, it may be a health issue. It's not always people-related. For some of us, it might be something related to our job. For some, it might be finance. But for some, it, it may be that there are just hard people in our lives. Maybe there are those at our workplace who, who don't want us to have that promotion. So they may try to sabotage that. There may be those on our school campus or, or wherever we are that want to seek to do us harm. The key here again is seeing God for who He is, that He is bigger than all of those things. So in the face of these fears, because of God, because of who God is, we can trust Him, saying, whom shall I fear? We can worship Him and find protection and peace in His presence. We can pray when our faith is weak. And then we can wait with courage and strength for, for Him to act for our good and for His glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that these words from Scripture, this, 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 uh, this just very uh, relevant psalm that, where David has written about how he has overcome fear. I pray that you would help us to, to absorb the truth that is there so that when we face the fears in our lives that are inevitable, that we would look to you and that we would see that you are our light, our salvation, our stronghold, that we can trust you, God. And Lord, I pray that we would find in worship a place of protection, Pray that we would be people of prayer so that when we face these fears, these things that come against our lives, that our first response would be to pray to you. And then, Lord, that we would wait for your goodness. Help us to do that, Lord. Pray that you would help us to take this to heart. Let these truths be life-changing for each and every one of us. For your glory. 